All right, so, well, okay, so you have the title. My collaborators are Yun Fan Lee, who is here in the audience, and Daniel, who is obviously also here. So, uh, <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about is basically what happens if you try to combine the dynamical decoupling with the error correction. And so uh, first I'll show you why this is, this may be necessary, then talk a little bit about some general results on dynamical decoupling, just describe you what to expect, what you may expect depending on the order, on the rate, etc. And then look at two different ways of combining these two algorithms and then give the so well so I'll be talking exclusively about the stabilizer quantum error correction codes and so so basically error correction as we all know is done by measuring the stabilizers and then you run the algorithm and so if you talk to an experimentalist he was saying well I want three qubit code he said wow three qubits is so much it's you know so really it's very expensive so if we have our code at the first level, perhaps it would be difficult to build the next level even with the three qubit. So if we have this real estate, we better use it very well. And so this is all about using real estate very well. So well, these are simulations, several simulations, where I run error correction in the worst possible settings. So I just add a field, which is error field, which is constant. It's not, it's an infinitely correlated noise. And then I average over that noise, imagining that, so for one qubit I have one, two, three fields. For 313 code I have three fields which are along the correctable error direction. For 513 code I have 15 fields. And then this is 515 code which is correcting two errors. I have five fields again along the Z direction phase fields correcting. And so what you see with the typical amplitude of these simulations over the time of, you know, 10, which is basically measured in pulse durations, as we will see later, you totally generate enough errors to spoil your error correction. Of course, what you have to do, you have to run it really quickly. You have to run it much, much faster than this period of time, and then you can maintain very small error. But just as I said, measurement, control, etc., etc., that takes time, and so it may be very expensive. So the question is, can we do better, and can we run dynamical decoupling? Because the dynamical decoupling is perfectly is perfectly suited to cancel those errors. And indeed, what you get is you can very nicely correct for these constant errors if you run dynamical decoupling with, with these pulses. And so now, again, just as I said, we want to use our real estate very very nicely and very carefully. And for dynamical decoupling, the real estate is the bandwidth. If you use band, band pulses that are infinitely short, that means they are infinitely wide in frequency. And so you <coughs> use a lot of real estate. So first you have to design your pulses carefully so that they would generate as little uh, sort of frequency footprint as possible. And so using these pulses, which are second order self-correcting pulses, meaning that in the NMR setting, the error, first error and first order and second error correction are first order and second order error is cancelled from refocusing. So using these pulses you can generate these traces. So for example for the 513 code you can reduce the error over time of a few hundred pulse, pulse durations. You can reduce the error to the order of you know 10 to the minus 3 to 0.1 and then with the error correction at the end you still get very nice, very nice accuracy. Now, of course, this is just the this is this is just the uh, dynamical decoupling. But what we would like to do, we would like to run some logic at the same time because the dynamical decoupling is just the way to freeze the qubits. But the big promise of this combined encoded dynamical recoupling is that you can run logic at the same time as the dynamic, as the refocusing pulses and as our session chair uh, sort of suggested long time ago. So what you can do, you say you run the 
you run the stabilizer pulses, and then at the same time you run at the same time you run your logic pulses and they commute with each other. And because of this commuting structure, ideally you would expect to be able to run logic pulses at any time. You, they commute. You can group them all at once or you can distribute them as you like. And so here is an example of, so here I have decoupling cycle. So here I have stabilizer 1, stabilizer 2, stabilizer 1 minus, stabilizer 2 minus. And so this is the decoupling pulses. And then I I run my logical pulses at basically at, our, at an arbitrary time, and this case is x, y, z, so that totals to identity operator. I could choose some other logical pulses if I wish. Moreover, even in the same setting, you can try to do that sort of slowly and kind of adiabatically run the logic. And because of this commuting structure, it doesn't appear to pose any problem if you try to do that. No, but now the question is indeed what is better and how do you get, you know, what kind of accuracy do you get as a result? And so in order to understand this, I need to tell you something about basically something about or something about this dynamical decoupling problem. And so, well, dynamical decoupling is you are trying to average away the external field. So you spin in your qubits and you are averaging away the external fields. And so the dynamical decoupling Hamiltonian is the main term. And then you go into the interaction representation with respect to decoupling uh, Hamiltonian, the pulse Hamiltonian. And then you are considering your system in the rotating frame. And so what happens in this situation, your original small frequency in the system are basically shifted out by Floquia harmonics, which are harmonics with the, with the frequency of the decoupling period. They are shifted away. And so if you originally had this big spectral weight near zero frequency, this big pulse, which couples very strongly to whatever low frequency spectral modes you have, when you run refocusing pulses, you shift that spectral weight away from the peak. And as long as you have at least first order refocusing, meaning as long as you suppress the zeroth order average Hamiltonian, this little red peak would not exist and so you will essentially decouple, you will suppress the T1 time entirely. Now, once you suppress the T1 time, we all know that T2 is related by analyticity, so you are supposed to do something to the phase relaxation as well, and indeed, if you analyze the kinetics, the quantum kinetics of this expression, and that you can do in general. You just assume that you have, if you have some constant fields and if you have some system, which is a finite size system, which is presumably your qubit system, but it doesn't have to be. And if you run your if you run your Hamiltonian in such a way that the evolution in the constant fields is cancelled either to first order or to second order, you can, you can derive results what would happen if those constant fields now become coupled to the bath, and in this case it would be a bath of oscillators, and you can sort of extract general results. And so if you have first order refocusing, that means if the average, zero order average Hamiltonian vanishes, you will eliminate single photon decay just as, you know, follows from that argument by Kuritsky and Kaufman, but in addition, you modulate the remaining fields. So the remaining, the fields which fluctuated slowly now start to fluctuate very rapidly. And so your dephasing rate, your phase diffusion rate will be reduced by this factor, by the factor of ratio of the times. Now, it turns out that if you have second order decoupling, if you, for, if you cancel not only the first order average Hamiltonian, but also the next order in the effective Hamiltonian theory, then as long as you do it for, you, as long as you don't generate new terms, you can have, you can suppress all orders in this ratio of times. And so you will have something like an exponential reduction in the dephasing rate uh, as long as you have this effect. Of course, you will have also third order, fourth order, but in, in the amplitude of the field, but you can't suppress everything. So this is perturbative technique by, you know, in principle. Now, 
also important statement that in addition to this general dephasing rate which tells you what the exponent is, you also have the matrix element. And matrix element is basically is, determines the visibility. So you have your Rabi oscillations, but the question, do the Rabi oscillations extrapolate to one if you start at t equal to zero? So, the so you reduce the visibility by this amount. So the reduction factor is one minus the square of the B times the tau squared, where tau is the period of the refocusing. And so, so now what we want to do, we want to run both dynamical decoupling and logic. And so unlike the original dynamical decoupling setting, the logic is not periodic. So you will have some frequencies that go all the way to zero. But on the other hand, the environment Hamiltonian, the logic Hamiltonian, and the dynamical decoupling, the Hamiltonian, all of them commute because you know, the logic and decoupling by, by extension, by, by construction, and the environment by assumption. And so, so what happens then, you have to go to the interaction representation with respect to all three of these Hamiltonians. And of course, your originally slow noise would now get modulated with all of three frequencies. So you have one frequency, which is decoupling frequency, which is presumably large then you will have the slow frequency due to environment, and then you will have presumably slow environment or some frequency due to logic. And so if you think about this separation of frequencies, you want to push your spectral weight away from zero frequency, then you would say, all right, so here the red is the picture which we had without the logic. But then if you start running the logic, then you will widen these peaks. And if you want to avoid the overlap with the, with the low, low frequency modes, if you want to avoid T1, then you arrive at this adiabaticity condition. And so you say, all right, now, then the idea then would be you have to run your pulses very, very slowly. And so these are the logical pulses that here they are stretched into four durations, well, into four regular pulses. Now, on simulations, actually, this simulation is, I think, stretch is, scale is 16, this is 32, and this is also so 32. So I run it, we run it for quite, quite a wide logical pulses. And so you see, if you look at the accuracy, you see that the accuracy is not that great. So the best, this is environment had the correlation time of 60. And the environment was modeled as just a classical noise which had exponential decay rate. It was a classical Gaussian stochastic process which, with also, which also had the Gaussian correlation length. So this is not fixed frequency. There was no frequency, fixed frequency cutoff, but on the other hand, it was a sort of Gaussian cutoff. So this should be pretty good as far as the frequency is concerned. And so you see as you run this, this is the best uh, I guess this is the best one of them, either this or this, you will get the accuracy of some fraction of, some fraction of a percent, and this is average infidelity, by the way. And so after, after, then after, after you apply the error correction, and this is 313 code, you will get some improvement on accuracy, but even with this very long logic application, you still don't get as much accuracy as you would, good, as you would want to have you know, with, with this combined error correction scheme. And so to analyze this, we have to sort of look into what happens when you do the perturbation theory. And so these complicated plots, these actually plot the mismatch of different perturbation theory terms computed numerically. So this is dynamical time-dependent perturbation theory done numerically. So this is zeroth order, first order, second order, third order, and the fourth order. So the mismatch is computed numerically for this kind of pulse application. So we have fast pulses that apply decoupling and that run in sort of periodic sequence. Plus we have the logic pulse and over or logic pulses and over one period of this sequence we computed the time dependent perturbation theory. And so these are mismatches for constant applied, the, the constant environment. So this was, there was no time dependence in the environment. And you see in each of these 
The zeroth order term is 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, which is just a numerical accuracy. Whereas the first, second, and third terms are huge. And so, so what, what happens, the frequency decoupling doesn't really happen at this scale. So the only situation where it does happen is here. So this is the first order self-refocusing pulse, which is kind of similar to Hermitian nuclear magnetic resonance pulse, but it, it has a little bit smaller maximum power. So you see this first order as you increase the spread, the, the size of this logical peaks, the first order goes down slowly, but surely, and so it goes to the, to the order of some, something like 10 to the minus, uh, something like 3%. Now, to get fidelity from here, this is, this is for the 313 code, so you have to still divide it by the big number. So this is the mismatch, not the fidelity. So the, the fidelity contribution would be smaller, but nevertheless, what we see from this, from this sort of simulation is that the, uh, to achieve this frequency separation, you have to use quite a big scale. So you have to, again, use quite a lot of this real estate, which is the bandwidth. Now, so the second, if we go back to the paper, by the same paper, and there is another sort of idea is to run the, to run the logical pulses at the end of each refocusing interval. And so what happens there is you, in ideal situation, the, ref, the decoupling pulses would cancel constant noise. So if your noise is time independent, then it would be, and if the noise operators commute with each other, then you ideally would cancel exactly, not just to first, second, but to all orders if you have delta pulses. So if you, then if you, your errors that would get generated if you use logic application at the end of each pulse. Those errors so would be due to derivatives, so those would be powers of some powers of the frequency. So you will get errors that are proportional to powers of the frequency times your fluctuating fields. And and so on the other hand, and, and, and then so at the zero frequency, you will have scaling with the power of frequency at small frequencies, and so the overlap would be reduced, not exactly even for T1 processes, but it would be reduced as some, you know, you, will, you can get favorable scaling. And so you can also understand it from the point of view of visibility. So with this, uh, pulses applied at the end of each interval, basically you, as if you are starting a new cycle of decoupling at each interval. And so you will not get exponential reduction with the, with the scale of these pulses, with the ratio of the frequencies, but you will get a power law, and that could be good enough for our purposes. And then you can also think about it, again, in this frequency overlap language. And so now these are the results of the simulation. And so this is, for example, 313 code with the correlation. So this violet is line is for the noise correlation time of, I think it's 60, of 60. And you see it decays. Uh, well, which way does it decay? So as this is time goes on forward. And so what happens here is you get accuracy, which is, you know, about 1%, this is for, as, anyway, you get, you get pretty good accuracy, which is better than it was before, and you don't have this penalty because you run these logical pulses at the, on, at the end of each refocusing interval. So your penalty in terms of the bandwidth is just a factor of 16 in this scheme. So 16 because you see I insert the logical pulses in the, in the empty space between the regular pulses. So normally I can run de decoupling pulses back to back with these shapes, but by inserting them in the middle, I have to run them wider to maintain uh, the timing right. And so, so uh, for length eight sequence, the penalty is 16. And now this is the uh, perturbation theory result. So zeros, first and second order for constant, for constant perturbation are all nicely canceled. 
well, this is only for the specific, for eight pulse sequence with the pulses which are with the second order self refocusing pulses, but also for this four pulse sequence when I use second order self refocusing pulses as well. And so for this sequence, this is eight pulse sequence with, the, with these pulses, you get an error which is 10 to the minus four. This is 313 code. And so now this is comparing different schemes at the final time, which is 384, which turned out to be commensurate with all intervals that we used. And so you can see that for concurrent pulse, the minimum is something like a percent or something, whereas in here, before the error correction at the end of the cycle, you reach something like 10 to the minus four, three times 10 to the minus four. And so uh, this takes me to the conclusions. Basically, the key word is if you want to use concatenation, you better engineer your levels carefully. And so engineering is the key word. So in this case, you have to do pulse placement. You have to do pulse and sequence design very carefully in order to cancel the leading order errors. Now, the real estate that is used here is the bandwidth. And the bandwidth, of course, is the distance and frequency between the maximum sort of speed you can put the pulse in compared to whatever your uh, T1 time is, I, guess, I suppose. So, so usually for, for current systems, it's very rarely more than a few orders of magnitude. So there are very few systems where this bandwidth is very, very wide. Now, the analytical scaling, uh, we haven't got it from these results. We need to repeat the calculation with about two times longer time simulation. I don't think it would be a problem, but anyway. So, and then for the future, well, uh, uh, there are uh, things to do. So, thank you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes people express the concern that the main errors will occur during the logical gate operation. For example, superconductors, you know, you can have sort of parts and weak spots, and then you have to come out of those spots to execute gates. So, for example, in the last scheme that you presented, where you, you have the, I guess you call it interpolated, yeah. where you have the logical gates um, acting on their own, and between logical gates, you have this decoupling. Well, look, for, for these simulations, we only had one qubit. So the only logical gates that we did were one qubit gates. And the accuracy of the pulse, of each pulse, is quite good. And if you do the correct timing within the, de the decoupling interval, you can achieve good accuracy. Now, in order to do it right, we had to add, you know, we, we have the refocusing intervals, we have to add the logical gates in between, so we had to add one decoupling interval at the very end of the computation in order for, you know, to close the cycle. Yeah, but uh, but in this second we do both, con you know, all the errors that are, are accounted for in this simulation, at least in the, at this level. Now, what happens when you start unwrapping the code to do the logic interaction? This is something that uh, we still need to analyze. So, for example, if you want to exchange with several ancillas to run your, uh, you know, to, to, to run your code, to do the measurement at the end of the, then the timing of that process, uh, this is something that we still have to think about it. 